Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 14th week. And this is our last uh, week of our class for our Christian counseling. And uh, um, it's been amazing how you know our journey of learning has gone along. Uh, I truly hope and pray that there have been a lot of insights and thoughts and things that you have received uh, as a result of our class. So today, we're going to wrap up uh, uh, this entire course. I know through the course, we've uh, we've looked at many things, and it's been like an overview. It, these are not in detail, but uh, it's it's uh, it's an overview. And those of you who may be interested may, you know, can pursue to um, study and uh, work more uh, on uh, building your skill and techniques on 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 counseling skills. So um, <clears throat> to to wrap up this uh, the class, we're on the last chapter. That's the thirteenth chapter, which is ethics and boundaries in counseling. And I'm on page fifty five, uh, just to be able to look through some guidelines, some ethical guidelines and boundaries that we need to um, keep. Some standards that should govern the way that we conduct ourselves while we are. Um, in this kind of a ministry. Now, this has been uh, uh, some of these guidelines have been have been pulled out from uh, from from a professional Christian body. Um, but then, nevertheless, I, I, you know some of those it, it fr it's from the American Association of Christian Counselors. It's their code of ethics that's been pulled out, and this is basically for our learning also. So, um, uh, giving them their due. Or um, uh, also, uh, you know, uh, uh, having taken the these code of ethics and really discussing them, so you would uh, find this even um, actually published in one of the journals, which is called the British Association uh, for Counseling and Psychotherapy. So these are some of the guidelines that we will just look into, so that we are aware um, what should govern the way that uh, that when we when we are in this uh, profession of Christian counseling. OK, I'm just going to um, uh, share my screen. So just give me a minute. OK. All right, so um, it's just taking time. Yeah, OK, so that's coming up. All right. So we're going to be looking at um, uh, the ethics. Now, in any kind of a profession, you would know that uh, there are certain ethics that uh, we need to operate from. And so also, um, even, even Christian counseling, because it is, it's, um, th that it, it, this comes also as a professional field. So there are these ethics uh, that we need to um, look through. So one of the, the basis of the basic ethical foundation uh, which we have taken from is yes, from our scripture, from the, from the scripture. And um, uh, we, we do know that uh, uh, the foundation of um, or, or a model for Christian counseling, for practice, for its activities all come from Jesus uh, Christ and his revelation and what we see in the Old and the New Testaments of the Bible. We believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God and he is um, and what he has taught and whatever so whatever is scripture is the model for counseling, um, for its practice, for its ethics, for, for even the final authority for every matter that we may be looking into. Okay, um, we, we, we believe that Christian counseling is a spirit-led process of change. This process of change comes um, from the power of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, <clears throat> there is transformation, there is growth. Uh, it is also uh, at, some, at some point of time geared to help, uh, to help others maybe mature in Christ by um, by these um, by interventions which may be spiritual 
which may be psychosocial, which may be um, uh, interventions that deal with family issues like marriage or parenting. It could be even environmental uh, situations. So all of what we are doing should lead to uh, others growing or maturing in Christ. Okay. Now, when we look at uh, ethics, uh, what is what is what do we look at when we're saying ethics? It's certain principles, or maybe like we look like a definition and say, um, uh, if there are certain princip principles that specify what may be acceptable and what may be not. Uh, it is also, it gives us a clarification of things that we should be doing and things that we should not be doing. Uh, or in other ways, you know, to, to really, when you're looking at ethics in, in most simplest terms, you'll say, you know, what is right or what is wrong? Uh, and what, wh how do we uh, um, do or how do we manifest things that we believe in? So that's that's what we're looking at. And this is, and there are certain guidelines that the American Association of Christian Counselors has brought about. And that's something that, um, uh, you know, we, we need to, we, we just need to be aware of. So when we're looking at, uh, um, at, at the ethics, uh, the question that we ask is why? Why should we have a, why, why should we have an ethical code like this? So uh, the, the evidence, so what, what we do see is that there is a huge evidence of sometimes unprofessional and incompetent practices even among Christian counselors, um, uh, uh, which could include complaints of harm that counselors, Christian counselors could bring towards the counseling. And that's why, you know, we're basically looking at uh, some of these uh, ethics and some of these standards. So what this code does is it outlines a certain foundation of values, of preferred values, and also uh, an agreed terms of behavior, professional behavior, which uh, counselors can shape their identity and build their work. So these ethics that we're going to be talking about, it defines principles where practice uh, is acknowledged and also encouraged. And also this, um, this also includes limits um, or, or certain boundaries beyond which practice is not permitted or tolerated. So to provide an ethical framework from which um, uh, to work in order to assure the care or even the dignity of the individual who's seeking and receiving help or rece receiving a service. So that's why we need to have this ethical framework because we're dealing with people and whatever we deal with has to come from a base of value, from a base of ethics. So when we look at a code of ethics, um, these, these set of uh, um, uh, ethical considerations are a common set of beliefs and certain values that we are actually talking about, okay? They set standards of uh, behavior and care and concern from the part of the counselor. It also uh, gives an assurance to those outside who are seeking help that this is the kind of ethics that we, we do follow. It's also a protection for those who are practicing because there are some times that we may need to build some of these boundaries and suggest that this is only within these limits or these boundaries that we will work in. Like, for example, mm, um, there are many times in practice that, you know, maybe people come in, I'll give you an example, people come in uh, with mental health issues and uh, maybe there is someone who's, who's, uh, who, who a counselor is counseling, they may have a mental health condition. And when there is, a, um, let's say, a marriage proposal or things that come up, um, you know, they may, uh, uh, a larger family may approach the counselor to really understand whether there's been any kind of information that is shared about the um, the person of their mental health condition. Now, there are certain ethics that we need to follow, certain guidelines we need to follow, and that becomes like a protection. So, you know, as, as part of your profession, what I generally say is, you know, these are ethical considerations. These are things that are confidential and only that which I'm permitted to share, I would. So you do not breach that. And so that in itself keeps you protected 
um, uh, as, as a practitioner. Okay, it also reflects the fact that counseling, counseling is a, a profession and so is Christian counseling. And why, again, while there is the set of boundaries, it actually builds the bar up for a good sense of practice, for a quality of practice. And of course, there are, it helps also for any kind of complaint procedures. That is, in case there is any kind of an issue, it can be brought back and uh, uh, addressed accordingly. Okay, so uh, let's also just look at what is the um, <clears throat> what is the basic heart of this code? What is the mission of this code? Now, Christian counselors must recognize and keep um, high uh, or, or bring up the inherent God-given worth and dignity of every human person, right? Uh, who who comes to you. And this is how scripture sees man as human beings are God's creation and they have, and, and as a result, they are due the rights and the respect and everything that, um, that, that we need to give to them. Okay, so Christian counselors must express that appropriate care towards any counselee who comes to you or anyone who's inquiring of, of a service or anyone Who's, who you're encountering as a result of your practice or your ministry without any regard to their gender or their sexual behavior, their orientation, their race, their caste, their ethnicity, their religion, any or socioeconomic status, uh, their disability, their mental status, their occupation, education, marital status, belief system, whatever, right? So it, what we are doing over there is uh, the, the heart of these co this code is to show that God's love is unconditional and um, that exactly is also the place that the counselor does approach a person from. So it's the dignity and care of every individual is what uh, this code basically looks at. Okay? Now, just to bring about certain uh, scriptural admonitions that are there, uh, when, when you look through some of these verses, in this, there are two, three verses that are put up here. It, th this is an admonition, this is an instruction that we've been given to bear one another other's burden or to be able to do good to others, not to work from a place of selfishness or a place of malice or conceit, but to regard one another as more important than ourselves and not just look to our uh, to, to the four corners of our world, but also to the interest of others. And why do we do and how do we do that? We do that because we bear the mind of Christ. We have the same mind that Christ had because we are believers. So that's so when, when you look at this as a profession or you look at it even as a service, it's something that we are called to do. We are instructed to do to be able to bear one another's burdens, to be to do good and to do things out of humility um, and consider everyone important so that we are in a place of service to others, thereby having the mind of Christ, okay? So uh, this is just a biblical basis for us to understand when, when we're even looking at um, um, counseling and why some of these ethical considerations are, are needed, okay? So uh, there are, uh, I'm going to be sharing seven uh, in all, um, and we will go through each of these principles, um, uh, maybe one by one um, as we progress. Mm -hmm. So if you look at all of these principles, something that really uh, is highlighted is uh, you're ministering for the good of the individual, uh, of, of a larger community or a society, by promoting their mental health and their well-being. You're also in a place of honoring their commitments and keeping they're keeping promises that's including where you fulfill your own responsibility of trust in a personal relationship and you're dealing with them truthfully um, uh, with with that kind of a professional conduct and and that's what you will see in all of these principles that it works for the good of the individual for the community at large to pro promote well-being to promote a, uh, a wholeness partnering with god in doing that, where, where, when, 
uh, just as much as you are honoring whatever commitment and promises and fulfilling your responsibilities towards the person and towards building that trust in, in this relation, in, in the counseling relationship. Okay. So just to quickly go through this, and we, like I said, we will go through uh, all of this. When you look at these uh, principles or when you look at these code of ethics, you will see that there is also a call. We are called to do something. So uh, we show compassion. When we do, when we do show compassion, we are fulfilling our call uh, towards uh, towards servanthood. When there is competence, that is, we are building our excellence um, and you know growing in the profession, building the skills so that we can minister effectively. Consent in Christian counseling that we do not do anything outside of the willful uh, permission of our counselee, but uh, you are being integral to to do or to um, um, uh, to honor the will or to honor the decision of your counselee. Confidentiality it is uh, where you are being in a place of uh, being trustworthy being loyal to what you have committed to what you have promised okay uh, this is a call to dignity depend uh, even amidst <clears throat> different cultural um, uh, issues the, the cultural um, struggles um, i mean cultural differences there is a you you do meet the others needs or see them with dignity to see them that uh, to an honor and respect the culture that they come from okay collegiality in christian counseling which means the way that you relate to others in the profession maybe it's a pastor maybe it is a doctor that you're meeting maybe it is other medical um, professionals or other ministers that you have it is a call to build good relationships um, within the, the profession and last one is the uh, the community presence that is you being um, a helper within a larger community is again and we are called to serve call, called to to humbly uh, to to bring about service okay so we're going to look at each of this uh, one by one and uh, uh, then we'll we'll probably unpack them little by little okay so the first one that we see is compassion in christian counseling and uh, it, it being a call to servanthood. So when you look at counseling service, and especially Christian counseling service, compassion and service is actually the biggest hallmark um, of, of this ministry. Uh, as a counselor, we should proactively avoid any manner of harm, any manner of exploitation or uh, discrimination or injustice in, in every <clears throat> matter that's related to, to counseling, in any counseling related matter. And we ensure that we help uh, the overall well being and safety of your counselees. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, as a Christian counselor, uh, you are aware of your personal or the kind of influence you have on your counseling so you're aware of your spiritual influence your psychological influence your social influence and the um the way that you help in these relationships so because of a relationship <clears throat> like this um you do not uh, uh, as a christian counselor you do not use the power to uh, or the power dynamics to harm others even um, uh, you know, even uh, whatever, whatever it it could come up. So you do not, you do not engage in those dynamics because it is in a relationship like this because of the of the way this helping relationship is. Um, you do not um, harm others, even even it, it says even without an intent of harm, right? So being extremely careful in the way that uh, one deals with 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 a person. Okay. Now, there are some uh, um, some areas that a counselor does not condone, advocate, support, or assist. Okay, so Christian counselors 
uh, must strictly avoid all behavior or suggestions of practice that can harm uh, counselees or even that can reasonably harm counselees or their families or their social systems. So, so that's why you know the, the uh, it's it's brought about very strongly that you do not condone, you do not advocate or support uh, actions of some of these uh, areas that we've spoken about, right? Um, uh, and if you look at all of this, it um, imperils the human life. That is, it, it causes danger towards the human life. And what we are doing is we are agreeing to protect human life. And that should be always a top priority in any professional or ministerial intervention. So who counselees who do or intend harm, again, are not to be abandoned um, and should be continued to serve in these tr uh, troubles as far as it is humanly possible. But what we do uh, do share and say is that we do not support or assist or advocate this behavior. But if someone does come to you with this, you uh, speak to them in love, but do not uh, agree to their requests of um, uh, of this and, and really um, uh, condone or, uh, I'm sorry, really not support or not assist them in, in that. And, and it's uh, fair and it's right to share that uh, it is outside the scope of your value and your belief systems, even if there is a counselee who insists they get that kind of a support. Okay, So moving on, uh, the next one that we are looking at is competence. Competence in Christian counselling. And like we said, it's a call to excellence. Now, in so what we must uphold as a, as a counsellor who, uh, who is in the faith is a strong commitment to um, clinical and professional excellence. So what does competence do? Competence makes us um, uh, better at our work, uh, makes, uh, makes us um, grow in our work. And as a result, even with the process of caregiving, we are uh, we're, we're able to give the best that is needed. So, and that's why it's important as a counselor to keep pace with maybe research in the field, um, more knowledge that's coming about, learn about skills, update oneself with uh, uh, courses or, or whatever is current. Uh, so thereby, what are you doing? You're also, you're, there's a personal awareness of your own limitations um, and uh, you know you are in a place where you're being accountable um, where 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 there may, there may be certain areas that you may not be able to minister to okay and uh, also to understand that if you are not able to um, uh, help with that to make those adequate referrals or appropriate referral, referrals outside okay so uh, as a Christian counselor, we need to maintain that highest standard of competence with integrity, knowing and respecting the boundaries of competency, both your, uh, for you as well as those of others. So we honor that call to competence, to, to, to be competent in the kind of work that we are doing, OK? Um, uh, now, even, even in this um, stage, even as we are called to excellence, what we, what we do consider is to be able to refer to competent um, uh, colleagues whenever nece necessary. So uh, I, I think as a Christian counselor, you know, as it says over here, Christian counselors do not counsel or advise against professional counseling, medical or psychiatric treatment the use of uh, medication, legal counsel, or any other form of professional service, merely because we may believe that the practice is wrong or because the provider may not have a Christian orientation. So we've got to be careful that we do not do that. Okay. Now, uh, when do we consult or refer to others, uh, to other resources, is specifically when your uh, when there are limits of counseling competence or effectiveness um, maybe you know when you're facing issues not dealt with before or you've not experienced in handling such an issue that's when you you, you can actually re refer out or when counselors uh, counselees need further help um, uh, beyond your own training or your practice or your expertise that's another time that you can seek uh, uh, you can you can do a referral 
or when either the counselor or the counselees are feeling stuck in the process of uh, the counseling or are confused about the goals and uh, both the counselor or the counselee is not clear on how to proceed, that's probably, again, another time when you do uh, refer outside. And that shows excellence. Or when the counselee, counselees are deteriorating or not making any gain, uh, even after a number of sessions, there again is where you can refer. Um, the other other times are when when a counselee when when counselee is present, they are they're presenting an actual actual danger to harm themselves, maybe as a result of severe dep depression or a suicidal intent or behavior or excessive substance use or an eating disorder. Um, you know, you you may need to refer out to someone who has a has a greater medical professional experience or when the counselee presents an um, uh, you know a, a danger to towards others one is to yourself the other is towards others where there is extreme hostility where there is aggression or where there is violence or any threats um, that's when you refer or when the counselees experience an, uh, a decline in their ability to take care of themselves function in their day-to-day um, activities, whether it is at home or whether it's at work uh, or in any other setting, that's where you would need the support from anyone uh, from those outside. When the counselee is um, uh, in excessive, is, is using uh, substances excessively, um, they they will require detoxification, and that's when maybe you you may need help from a medical uh, issue. Or when counselees reality that their, their understanding of reality is severely impaired to the extent that you know they're not able to orient themselves they don't have a handle over their emotions they are at risk to their own life they have behavioral problems as an issue with memory um, you are seeing strange odd behaviors that's again when you do referral or when there is again now this is when there is strong issues of transference, which what is transference, transference or counter-transference? I know we haven't spoken about it, but we will talk about it a little later. Uh, is when either the counselee begins to counselor begins to identify very largely with the counsel counselee. You know, has a personal interest in the counselee as a result of maybe. Uh, some kind of internal dynamics that the counselor is going through, a counselor is going through, or counter uh, counter transference is when the counselee identifies very strongly with uh, with the counselor and uh, again builds that kind of an attachment. That's when uh, you know that that needs to be a referral. That's that's done. Um, so these are some of the considerations that um, that that you consider. Or even if maybe there are times the counselee themselves will say that they would like to see somebody else. And then you honor that decision and uh, allow them to, to get support or help from somebody outside. So all of this is what we call as a call to excellence, to be able to ensure that we, we are competent in what we're doing and when we are not to be able to hand over to, um, to someone else. Okay. The next one we're looking at is uh, sorry, I think I consent. Consent in Christian counseling, which again is a call to integrity. So one of the, if you remember in our first uh, <clears throat> first chapter, we spoke about certain principles of counseling and a fundamental right of a counselee um, of a counselee to determine for themselves what they would want to do is a pillar for counsellors and their counsellors. So consent allows for the counsellor to operate transparently and with integrity and for the counsellor to, to make that informed and voluntary decision to engage in this helping process. Okay, so uh, when you're looking at consent, you're saying that Christian counsellors need uh, to respect uh, the, the the need for an informed consent regarding the structure and the process of counseling. So at the at the onset of counseling, uh, counselors and counselees should discuss and agree upon some of the some of these. One is the nature and the course of counseling. That is, what are we going to do? What are the uh, what are going to be the expectations? Um, uh, what kind of issues we're going to be dealing with? What are some of the goals that the counselee wants to reach? What could be certain risks and problems that come 
uh, as well as what could be certain alternatives that are there to counseling if the uh, if the counselee wants to um, uh, talk about that um, the the counselor status or credentials you know um, what the counselor has studied and uh, uh, what approach they use confidentiality and its limits um, even fees and financial procedures if there are, if there is uh, any financial fee, a financial investment that goes into these counseling sessions, that should be discussed with um, time, time and access uh, to the counselor uh, when, when there is an emergency situation or even any kind of res resolving any kind of dispute or misunderstandings. So all of this is what we look at in consent. So uh, even here, we, we need to ensure when you're securing information, you're also um, uh, especially when you're seeing minors, right, that you get consent from parent or legal guardians or someone who represents them. And that's extremely important, especially when you're meeting a minor. Uh, and even um, uh, uh, you need to keep a document of consent. Now, in, in and I'm, I'm sharing this is because even in Chrysalis, uh, uh, the, the wing of uh, a counseling wing in APC, we do uh, follow these these uh, uh, these protocols where there is a consent form that's given. There are certain details that's that's spoken about there. There is also the details of we we take consent that 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 our service is more um, is is geared towards biblical and spiritual practices in counseling. So we we do share that upfront so that then later there aren't there isn't any kind of an ambiguity that comes about. Okay, then. Uh, Okay, I'll just stop here. Are there any questions? Uh, because then there's absolutely no feedback. Sorry, I think there's someone who's sent a question. John, okay, let me address that question. What if we are in a what if we are in a leadership position and are asked about a person from our congregation regarding, say, a marriage uh, proposal, if we've come across any confidential information through counseling, if asked to give our genuine opinion about the person, how do we handle that? OK, so um, and I think I, I did maybe this has did this answer your question Did the last point answer your question, uh, Pastor John? Um, could you walk through again? Let, just one more time. OK, please. OK. So. If there is, if there is uh, confidential information that has come as a result of counseling, that's something that you need to keep confidential. Even if, um, you know, especially like this, and, and I understand that there may be marriage proposals that come about this way, whatever has been spoken in the counseling room continues to be, to be confidential, to be only something that's discussed there, unless, of course, your counsel counselee has given you the consent to share certain information with somebody else unless um, if, if that if, if that uh, uh, if if they do not give you the consent then we are breaching that confidentiality okay so uh, i think personally what i would suggest here is that let's say if there's a marriage proposal someone's come in and, and asked you certain details um, that's something that you it, it may not be right on your part, even as a minister or as a pastor, to be able to give that information. What I would now I would see this specifically in mental health issues, you know, um, when, when there are proposals that come. And something that I attempt to do is let's suppose I'm meeting counselee B, and there is a proposal with Mr. A. Let's say it's Miss B and Mr. A. So I would um, work alongside with Miss B to, to be able to, the, the need or the, or the importance of sharing the condition that she may be in to, her, to Mr. A, uh, as because, because uh, mental health conditions can have long-term impacts even into the relationship. I wouldn't, um, I would not uh, bring about the information with Mr. A, but I would walk alongside with Miss B and speak to her and help her come to a place of determining the need and the importance of bringing about this information with Mr. A. And that's something that I would leave for them to do. 
But if there were sensitive information that's asked, I would probably say that's that is beyond my scope of uh, sharing because uh, some of those details have been um, are within a counseling room, and that's not part of. Um, my consideration. So that's something that I would be very careful of doing and maybe important for you to uh, do as well. Uh, Pastor Chan, does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, yeah. But in this case, I'm just trying to uh, think one more. Um, so we, uh, we are asking like, hey, did you know this earlier? Then how do we, uh, like, you know, let's say something happened after we give the opinion or we, let's say we, we don't talk about this. And some later, sometime, um, the issue is coming up. And if they are asking, um, "Hey, did you know this earlier? And why did you tell <laughs> something like that?" I mean, it, it's a tricky part, but I'm just thinking along like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think we don't put ourselves in this soup. If right in the beginning, maybe at the time of the wedding or the proposal that comes, that we do not as ministers or as counselors do not give them a go-ahead sign it's not right. for us to make that determination or make that choice they are to make the choice right right so uh, it's I, I think we uh, it's a problem when if we have been party to make that choice and say oh it's this is a good person or you know these are certain things you know like go ahead right uh, it's almost like they're coming to you for an approval to do that but that's something We've got to be extremely careful not to do, rather than oh, so. So if there is a someone who comes to you, help them say, okay, would you like to see the pros and the cons, and what does it look like to you? Is this something you feel you want to go ahead with? Okay, um, that's what you have have decided. Let's pray and move forward. So the, our approach needs to be very careful prior to this in itself, so that we don't right. bring ourselves to a point where we've given the consent and then someone asks us for. Uh, a, yes, you know, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For, yeah, that's yeah. really helpful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions? Any uh, anyone else has any other questions? Okay. If not, then we'll move on. All right. So the next one is uh, collegiality in Christian counseling. And uh, so just to just to unpack this entire thing is uh, to understand that um, as counselors, as Christian counselors or, uh, you know, people who are leading or who are in min ministry must really recognize the benefit of forming uh, effective professional and ministry relationships with others across, you know, across other areas, right, in, in multiple areas. Um, and, and it's important because it really helps in building up people. It really helps in maybe doing the best that we can to work uh, and, and help help others. So this these um, uh, you know these uh, uh, networking or these relation uh, building these professional and uh, relationships could be um, you know to fellow mental health practitioners. It can be to other ministry leaders. It can be to supervisors, it can be to mentors or educators or researchers or even counseling related sources. So this cooperation and respect must be encouraged because they are opportunities to work for on a common ground, work on common purposes. So and, and that's what you would um, you would you know, grow to, to to be able to do so that you're you're working together for the benefit of uh, of of others. Okay, the next one is confidentiality uh, in Christian counseling, and there here is where it's a call to trustworthiness. I think yeah, this is this is probably the point that uh, um, that we were talking about earlier. So, what does confidentiality recognize? It it recognizes that every counselee has a right. Um, both a moral as well as a legal right to privacy and, uh, uh, and in, uh, to have a wide range of those thoughts, opinions, beliefs, behaviors that they may want to protect from those outside. Okay? So the alliance between a counselor and counselee is enhanced whenever there is an environment that offers that level of confidentiality, privacy and safety. Now, this dynamic between a counselor and a counselee 
this confidential dynamic really helps to promote strong and trustworthy relationships. So counselors must be extremely careful not to break that confidentiality regarding counseling communications without first discussing um, the this disclosure or the intended disclosure. And I and uh, like we do, we we secure a written consent from the counselee or a representative that from from that person. Because uh, sometimes, I mean, I, I know far too many, maybe not within the Christian circle as much, but far too many where um, counselors have been sued because um, confidentiality has not been maintained. Okay, now. Even as you're doing this, you, it's important to discuss the limits uh, of, of confidentiality. Um, when you're looking at limits of confidentiality, you're, you're basically uh, uh, informing the counselees that the counselor is committed to confidentiality, um, but also may have certain limits before engaging in counseling. So Christian uh, counselors must avoid stating or implying that your confidentiality is guaranteed or absolute. Uh, you, you shouldn't say, whatever you tell me, I will keep confidential. But you need to discuss the limits of confidentiality, privacy, or that communication with, with, with your counseling at the beginning of the at the uh, beginning of counseling. So uh, th there is a rule of mandatory disclosure and, and that that is that's there uh, uh, that that's like you know um, like the doctors take the hippocampus law oath, I think that's what it's called. Hippo not hippocampus, hypocritic, hippo. I'm sorry, I've forgotten what the word is. If anyone knows, please clarify, I've forgotten what that is. But they take a take an oath saying that there will be no harm. That is uh, that is uh, bought out to patients, right? So similarly, there is a rule of mandatory disclosure, and that is to protect people from deadly harm. So Christian counselors also accepts the limits of confidentiality when human life is either abused or impaired or is in danger, and that's when you counselors take appropriate action, uh, and uh, and this could include even. Uh, necessary disclosure of confidential information so that one can protect the life of, of a counselee. For example, under certain threats of suicide, homicide, serious bodily harm, uh, life-threatening disease, uh, abuse of children, uh, elders, or dependent persons. This is when confidentiality can be breached. And this is something that we do share right in the beginning that uh, this would be uh, you know, if, if at any point of time this is this is observed or assessed, there would be uh, uh, the, there would this would need to be disclosed to someone so that they can be protected, or any other person within their sphere of influence could also be protected. Okay, so that's that's what we look into um, confidentiality. Then we move on to. Um, we move on to uh, a cultural regard that's that's uh, in Christian counseling. Now, um, so culture, cultural, et ethnic uh, diversity are very important factors that we need to consider while we are bringing about counseling related services. So cultural competency, what does it signify? It's a knowledge and awareness that represents things like as values, norms, traditions of other people, their perceptions, their thoughts, attitudes, their beliefs their identity, their dynamics of relating to others, their life experiences, their customs, their spirituality, um, uh, understanding of all of this in relation to their human problem. Okay, So what we're doing is, as a counselor, we recognize and acknowledge that all people, like we said, have been created in the image of God. And therefore, all counselees, they have an innate right to be valued and respected uh, so that they can receive the most ethical care and to be treated with the most dignity. So now this specifically comes when we're working with person, people of different faith or religion or value. So counselors, we work to understand the counselee's belief system, always maintaining the respect for the counselee and strive to understand when faith and value issues are really important to the counseling. 
so we uh, in in this in this ethic or in this consideration there's we foster um uh, uh, you know the the decision making process in in counseling so counselors share their own faith you could share the, your own faith orientation as a function of legitimate self disclosure and when appropriate uh, to the counselee's need always maintaining a posture of humility so so even when we are in in a place of counseling especially when we are counseling uh, uh, non believers right the 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 focus is not to to uh, build on them your faith the focus is to help them with their struggle and thereby as a function of self disclosure and whenever necessary and whenever appropriate there is um, you know there is a sharing of your your orientation or your faith okay so christian counselor um, as a christian counselor we do not or should not be withholding service to anyone of a different race or faith or religion uh, or a value system because of what we believe in and and that's the guideline that that is given over here however if you do feel that it is something that is not in your purview that's something that you can share maybe it's not in your purview of understanding or maybe the expertise is not there but we do regard everyone uh, um, this um, irrespective of what kind of a background they come from right okay uh okay we are at uh, 10:50 i think right now um and i think we'll take a 10 minute yeah we'll take a 10 hippocratic oh, thank you thank you johnny i said it's right yeah so we'll take a, a break of uh, 10 minutes and we will come back we'll come back at 11:00 and uh, complete the, the rest <laughs>